Good morning again. This time I'm honored to introduce our next keynote session, a fireside chat featuring Senator Mark Warner from Virginia. Senator Warner is chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, a prominent committee that provides oversight of America's intelligence community. We are delighted to have him here with us today as we discuss this very important issue in the broader framework of government, federal oversight, and public policy. Please join me in welcoming back George Washington University President Mark Wrighton, who will moderate this conversation. A reminder that if time permits, we'll be taking audience questions. Please submit your questions via pigeonhole so that President Wrighton will be able to see them. President Wrighton, Senator Warner. Senator, as a great alumnus of the George Washington University, we're delighted to have you. Legislative approaches to assuring cybersecurity have been mentioned this morning. You're the only legislator we have on the program, so and we the appreciate- And guy for a legislator. We appreciate uh, very much your being here. I'm going to ask a few questions. I'll receive uh, questions from the audience. There are many people online, mm -hmm. and they will have opportunity to ask questions, I hope, also. But I want to touch on a couple of things that uh, you've been prominent in mm -hmm. terms of thinking about. One is Internet of Things. Another is cybersecurity and healthcare, preparation of a workforce for cybersecurity, and uh, issues around uh, supply chain and cybersecurity. So let's turn first to a question about uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, they have been addressing the Internet of Things security, and how does this incorporate sections of the Internet of Things Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2020, which you and several other senators sponsored? Well, first of all, President Wright, thank you for having me. It's great to be back on campus. Um, I looked at the outline you've got today for this um, series of meetings, and a, a very impressive group of speakers. So I'm. Um, following some of the folks who have already come, they've probably laid some of the predicate down uh, that I'll build on on your question, which is, candidly, Congress has not been very good about getting its arms um, around cybersecurity. Uh, I come at this from a variety of backgrounds. And one, I was a tech guy before I got into politics. I was uh, uh, started the wireless company Nextel, then became a venture capitalist. So having a little bit of knowledge on capital goes a long way. I uh, ended up starting actually the Cyber Caucus back in the 2015-2016 time frame, and has been mentioned, I'm, I'm chairman now of the Intelligence Committee. And then what got me concerned about IoT devices was, you know, here we were about to bring into our lives literally billions of new devices. Uh, we all think about what an interconnected world is going to look like, the whole notion of smart cities, autonomous vehicles, all of that in many ways is dependent upon um, having sensors in, in, in uh, a whole host of things that we, we interact with on a daily basis. And as we were starting down that path, it struck me that within IoT devices, we didn't even have a minimum level of security. So we were having these devices that were not patchable, that had embedded passcodes. Any kind of cyber hygiene 101 was not being filed. So the, the path of getting this legislation approved, um, it was a heck of a lot harder than it should have been, which was basically saying, at least in terms of DOD purchases, and we thought we could use the government as a purchasing agent um, uh, to drive industry, we would have this minimum cybersecurity standards. It took us a couple years to get passed. By the time it, it did get fully passed, it frankly has still been fairly watered down. Um, and while I think we are making some progress in, in moving uh, IoT connected devices to that minimum level of security, the higher end manufacturers were fine with it. Uh, 
the lowering guys that wanted to do the cheapest of, of sensors didn't want to have those minimum security standards. And we've ended up with kind of this, this hybrid approach. And it just let me just go ahead and hit one other quick piece of legislation we've done uh, as well that, that was also a little bit frustrating. And, and that was after the solar winds hack, uh, it became evident that, in my mind at least, that we needed to make sure that we had at least if it was a major cyber incident, there would be some level of reporting to government. Not so that government could regulate you, tax you, slap your risks, but to make sure that we could then share with the private sector. Most of the presenters you've had this morning are from private sector companies, so that we could be aware and, no and notify folks in the private sector. Uh, and I know you've got somebody, I think, appearing from CISA. We set up CISA a few years ago as that um, cybersecurity agency to work with the private sector uh, again, in a collaborative fashion rather than a regulatory fashion. Uh, and we, so we put together legislation to have this cyber incident reporting legislation. Um, and what drove it, I mentioned solar winds, but there was also the Colonial, Colonial Pipeline hack, where Colonial Pipeline reported that hack, but at the exact same time, there was another pipeline company that was being hacked that didn't report to the government. Again, long story short, the sausage making process, we ultimately got a bill to the president to be signed, but the business community weakened it so much that we're, we're taking now five years to implement the cyber incident reporting legislation. So across the board, Congress is great, I think, on one, understanding cyber, two, putting legislation in place that kind of protects our national infrastructure, protects our assets, recognizes that cyber is going to be a challenge uh, in, in terms of nation states. Uh, I think I would not give Congress uh, uh, a, a, uh, I wouldn't give them high marks. They might get a, a um, gentleman C or a C minus or something, but uh, not much better than that. So, like many, uh, you sound to be a little skeptical of a purely regulatory approach from legislation. So, what can we do in the way of partnerships that would be more effective? than this legislative well, approach? Well, I'm not giving up on the legislative. I think there will be needs to be legislative. Um, I'm, I'm frankly disappointed that we, we don't move quicker, number one. Um, number two, I do think we've, we've practiced a lot of public-private um, partnerships, and that is important. Uh, and the pushback comes, though, when we talk about minimum cyber hygiene standards whether they are voluntary or, or, or mandatory. I think what we've had in the past is generally voluntary regimes um, until we put things like the IoT or the incident reporting legislation on the books. I increasingly believe uh, that voluntary cannot be uh, the only way. I think we are gonna need uh, some level of mandatory standards and they need to be flexible enough so that you know, it's, with cybersecurity constantly changing, the bad guy's getting better, the good guy's getting better. How do you make sure that you're not legislating a static response in an ever-changing field? Um, but one area that I've spent a lot of time on in the last couple of years is cybersecurity and healthcare. And you know, there's no more lucrative ransomware domain than healthcare information, even more valuable on the dark web than, than personal financial information. And too often in healthcare, we end up bolting on cybersecurity protections after the fact. Uh, I think we need to really think about cybersecurity and healthcare as being built in at the beginning, and particularly when you've got healthcare systems, you've got medical devices, you've got a, a wide range of providers. How do you really incent that to be um, kind of built in uh, from the beginning of, of um, next generation healthcare design? Uh, I think on some of those areas we're going to need mandatory, and that's, that's a work in progress. And some of the, the, the White House recently put out um, their cybersecurity uh, white paper, in a sense, would had four or five uh, different focus areas. And one of that was also trying to mention that we need more mandatory, and frankly, maybe even shift some more of these requirements back to the manufacturer side rather than to the, the user side. Well, we have the George Washington University Hospital. We have a major medical school with a significant clinical practice. Uh, your paper on cybersecurity is patient safety. Mm -hmm. um, reminds me to ask you about uh, 
how we're going to sustain the operations of hospitals during a cyber attack. This is life and death for people in the hospitals. Well, one, absolutely right. Two, one of the reasons why uh, cyber crimes have been so lucrative in the healthcare field is because you can bring a hospital to your, its knees and the default notion of paying the ransom versus the life and death choices uh, puts many of these healthcare systems in, in, at, that, at that core point. And I think that's why most folks have had to pay. Uh, and the challenge, you know, I think when you think about cybersecurity and healthcare, when you've got a major hospital as we've got a GW, is you, you've got all these machines, devices, monitors. If there are legacy, legacy systems in your hospital, you know, what's going to be the responsibility to, for the provider to go back and retrofit and upgrade? I don't think we're going to be able to go back and rechange out every x-ray machine. But I do think on a going forward basis, if we start building in cybersecurity, de minimum standards, um, some ability to kind of upgrade in new devices, new equipment, new software systems, uh, we're going to be safer over the long run. But the notion of how we deal in the short term um, when, when the cyber criminals can get in and potentially shut off your systems, um, you know, I'm hoping for uh, crowds like this to give us some more ideas because uh, uh, I've read a lot, followed a lot. We put out this white paper. Um, uh, there, I've not seen a magic bullet solution yet. I'd like to shift the conversation a little bit to a topic that I know concerns you and other senators and many people. And this relates to international collaboration by academic institutions. Uh, I'm very chronologically mature. <laughs> Frankly, <laughs> I would like to see a global effort in uh, tackling diseases like Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. But I know that there are concerns about uh, cybersecurity issues and others that uh, relate to uh, the transfer of technology in the course of what would be more wholesome collaborations with international institutions. How are you feeling now? about international collaborations, especially in areas related to artificial intelligence and cybersecurity? Well, let me, let me take that in, in two chunks. First, and this was something that I didn't, I didn't realize until I uh, um, you know, learned more and have spent, had spent a, num a number of years on the Intelligence Committee. You know, there were efforts in the late 90s to try to have some level of international collaboration around cybersecurity. Uh, the, the idea of what would be almost a Geneva Convention type um, set of agreements uh, that might say, you know, cyber attacks in, in, uh, on healthcare systems are, are going to ha carry a higher penalty or there will be some level of international sanctions. And I didn't realize that it was actually the United States that did not want to be involved and set up an international cybersecurity regime in the late 90s because the United States at that point felt it was far ahead of nation states around the world and potential competitors like China and Russia. Uh, and I think we probably have come to, to rue that because um, uh, as we think about nation state competition uh, across a whole host of technology domains, um, you know, having put in place something that would have said, you know, we're going to have potentially a lower attribution standard if you whack a healthcare system, and if we can attribute back to a nation state rather than the actual individuals, there might be higher levels of penalties. If we'd had some of that international order in place, I think we'd be in a better in a better circumstance. And again, I think, based upon what I know now, the U.S. didn't want to do that because we were we were further ahead in terms of international cooperation. Um, I think we are, we are uh, obviously in enormous conflict with Russia and, and their authoritarian regime. Um, but we're also, and, and this is something where I have, I have changed my, my views pretty dramatically over the last uh, 15, 20 years, I think in dramatic competition with China. 
And when I say China, uh, let me be clear, as a policymaker, my beef is with the Communist Party of China and Xi Jinping's leadership. It is not with the Chinese people. It is not with the Chinese diaspora. It sure as heck is not code for kind of the, uh, the anti-Asian bias that we see too often pop up its head in this country. But uh, I, I, you know, one of the, the evolutions that I've dealt with is you know, dealing with China and, and their authoritarian regime and their willingness to use you know, steal intellectual property, uh, try to penetrate our systems. Um, you know, we have not seen that kind of competitor. I grew up, I'm that also chronologically mature or old, as I may be the simpler statement. <laughs> you know, I grew up with the conflict with the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was an ideological threat and a military threat. It wasn't an economic threat. China is, is a great, great nation, and, but they are investing in ways that we used to invest post Sputnik. And so this competition with China uh, are around technology, around artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, synthetic biology, you name it, all of these areas where there could be uh, uh, international cooperation is really, really robust. We've seen Congress act on that. The, in many ways, the, um, uh, the semiconductor chip bill was a response. Uh, I think we're gonna have to make similar investments in other domains. I do think where I hope we can work closer is with, um, non-authoritarian nations around the world. This cannot, uh, should not turn into a U.S. versus China competition. It needs to be those non-authoritarian regimes, the non-China, Russia's, Iran, North Korea's, and versus everybody else. And I do think there, there's going to be opportunity um, for international cooperation around research, international cooperation uh, greater around cyber. I know one of the earlier panels was this morning. Um, if you had, if if China, with the kind of CCP's almost Orwellian surveillance um, techniques, were to kind of uh, win the AI battle, if that doesn't make you nervous about what kind of world that would lead us into, um, then we're probably not doing a very good job of educating this competition. So I think there are great opportunities for, for collaboration. I think one of the things uh, that, again, American policymakers need to be cognizant of is even just our language. Sometimes when we say America and NATO or America and the West, we candidly piss off two thirds of the rest of the world. You know, we piss off everybody in India. We piss off everyone else in Asia who would collaborate with us. We offend Africa and South America. I think we need to find a way to say non-authoritarian regimes need to collaborate not just on cyber, on AI, but on this host of technology domains where we are in active competition. Thank you. Turning to the workforce, it is said that there are going to be 3.5 million job openings worldwide in a couple of years. And uh, in your view, uh, how can government and the private sector and universities partner in bolstering U.S. cybersecurity workforce? It, that's, a, that's a great question, and, and so far, Again, I wouldn't give us uh, uh, all that good a grade. I remember, you know, we used to, I used to quote in Virginia, I think we had 135,000 unfilled cyber jobs, starting average salary, $88,000 a year. And they didn't even require, a lot of them, a full four-year degree. So how we move more folks into, into cyber earlier, recognizing that cyber does, you know, we need our computer scientists, but there are also folks that can come out of community college and other, uh, you know, um, Less, you know, less parts of education and be in the cyber workforce. One of the things that may be taking place, and uh, as we see so many of the big platform companies, the social media companies and others go through that first round of, you know, they overhired during COVID and now you're seeing some of the layoffs. Maybe if we could transport more of those folks from our friends at Google or Meta and elsewhere into cyber uh, and, and make a clearer pathway, that would be helpful. Um, I do think one of the things back on the healthcare issue, you know, how we recruit more folks into cyber healthcare is extraordinarily important. And I think we have to be more creative. I've got some uh, legislation out that would, that would provide, for example, um, tax-free down payment assistance um, for healthcare slash cyber workers in rural communities that might be an innovative way to, to attract people. But we are not doing the job that we should and could in cyber. And I almost feel like um, cyber was, we go through periods when 
a, a new terminology becomes a hot buzzword. Like cybersecurity became was the buzzword for most of the last you know, five to 10 years. Any government project put cyber next to it and they thought they could get more, more government money. I feel like that is being replaced by AI uh, as, as the new buzzword and, and I'm trying to get educated as quickly as I can there. And I feel like we have not uh, uh, done a very good job, Mark, of, of how we really meet that cyber workforce needs. Um, uh, it's, going to take, it's going to take greater incentives from the government and frankly from the private sector. Yes, one of the questioners uh, from the audience says, physicians, the leaders and end users of Internet of Things should be educated uh, on cybersecurity starting in medical school and continue. This is not happening. How do you envision ensuring medical cyber education? I'll take that one. We should do it. And research universities in America often have very strong medical schools, and this should be included in medical education. And it should also be included in, you know, as a um, uh, went to law school, never practiced a day of law, but I, I know in medical school, just in law school, there is, you know, you've got to do continuing medical ed education. There's continuous legal education. Cyber ought to be a component of all those, at least to understand what basic cyber hygiene looks like. I mean, there's certain things, dual authentication, that are kind of no-brainers, but the failure to have um, that as part of continuing, edu continuing education is a huge miss. The other thing, though, uh, that I really think we need to start to grapple with and realizing that there are probably lots of folks from the software industry in here, um, the fact that we've been willing to take particularly software products um, that have got embedded mistakes in them and not hold, in effect, the creator, the manufacturer, the software code writers at some level responsible, I think we're going to have to have a fulsome debate about that. Some level of, of upstream responsibility that if you've got, and there are certain software companies that are extraordinarily well known, that are, that are also well known for having more built-in bugs and not very responsible about going, going through and trying to sort those out, because they've never had liability. I'm not saying I'm going to a full software bill of liability, but I think that ought to be a, a, a we have to go up the food chain a little bit in, in terms of the products and services that are being offered and hold the, the, in effect, the manufacturer or the designer a bit more responsible. One of the questioners uh, from the audience points out that FBI's cyber budget is smaller than a large company that spends in this area. Do we need to increase the FBI budget in this area? And will you consider increased dollars? Well, we've got, we, short answer is yes. But we have this kind of, of ongoing um, debate. We've got you know, FBI over here on the criminal side, on cyber. We've got CISA over here on the kind of relationship side, it, and it's been growing rapidly. It's supposed to be that coordinator with the private sector. Then we've got our, our kind of our best cyber talent on the intel side at NSA look, looking outward. And we don't kind of have a whole of government, whole of society approach around cyber. Um, in healthcare, one of the things we don't have, we don't really have anybody in charge. There's four different cabinet secretaries and 12 different departments that touch healthcare and cyber. Um, how we restructure that is a challenge. I mean, the Brits do a better job, frankly, because their outward-facing cyber, GCHQ, their equivalent of the NSA, they built, they don't have that kind of inside-outside dichotomy. They built their domestic cyber entity as a subset of GCHQ, and so you've got some of that great talent flow, and they've got a single um, domestic-facing entity that seems to work better, that also does the cyber education piece. We've kind of got it mismatched between you know, the collaborative piece at, at, at CISA, the criminal justice piece at, at an investigatory piece at the FBI, going for foreign, foreign entities at NSA, and then things like cyber healthcare left off to the side, or cyber education left off to the side. We don't have kind of, again, a whole of government approach. Senator, you seem to have a great grip on the issues. 
Uh, I applaud you, and uh, you're one of the most distinguished graduates of GW. Thank you for being here this morning and illuminating us about the legislative side of the issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.